Um, okay, so let's start. Welcome everybody to the third day of ACT 2021. Um, we're starting with a presentation by Vince and then Joelle about limits and cool limits in category of lenses. Go ahead, Vincent. Thank you very much. Uh, wow, we are used to this complexity. This is uh, the fruits of our labors from last year's adjoint school. As you know, the lockdown happened then, we weren't able to go to Boston. So this is the result of meeting fortnightly, a, you know, a group of people split across three continents for a year. So, you know, miracles do happen. We're gonna be talking about a category of lenses. I'm very excited to, to tell you about the properties of this category of lenses. And of course, you know, saying ACT and lenses, there's more lenses in ACT than are, you know, Pokemon at this point, because lenses are a really common concept to talk about the interrelation of two systems. So rather than think of uh, lenses as a species of mathematical object, it's more of a genus. So we have to we have to tell you exactly what kind of lenses we're interested in as well. All right. So formally, we'll get to that. But first, let's have an informal picture. Joel? Okay. Suppose that we have a, a system and an interface, and we're dealing with a problem here that's broadly speaking, one of synchronization or interoperation between the system and the interface. So what happens is you have a bunch of system states and you have a getter, a getter, an F that sends things down. Um, so I've got a great important announcement to make. Uh, we have two weddings to celebrate. Uh, uh, Vincent Wang has got engaged yesterday. His girlfriend. So we think this is definitely going to become a tradition at ACT, ACT right? With a focus on um, composability. We acknowledge their respective co-limits and we hope mm -hmm. that they push out something soon. <laughs> but let's congratulate them. I'm so glad we'll give you some extra time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Um, yeah, it makes this seem like not gonna... Right, so you got a system and you got an interface um, and you got this getter. What am I doing here in Cambridge? Like I should be... All right, and uh, Joella, next slide, please. Right, so in the interface, in the interface state that you arrive in, there are a couple of things that you might do. You might want to move to another interface state. There might be different ways to move between two interface states that you might deem important to keep track of. That's illustrated by this bold red arrow among a little home banana of, of other arrows that you might take. And now you want to go and update your system with the information that, with the informational change that you just made in your interface. So do you want next? All right, what does that mean? Well, the, the state that you arrive in in the interface is gonna be consistent with some other system states by this getter. Really? And what it means to perform an update in this case is to pick something concrete, to pick a concrete implementation. And what does that mean? It means to say, well, I have to know what my initial system state was out of that fiber of things above my uh, initial interface state. Joelle? And then knowing that and knowing the particular interface transition that I've just made, I need something that helps me choose one particular way to get from a system state to another system state so that this entire diagram works out. Next, Joelle. Okay, so now I'm ready to, to taxonomize this lens for you. We're talking about lawful, category-based, and asymmetric lenses. So, Joelle. When I say lawful, I mean to distinguish it from the uh, Wild West that you'll be, uh, the Wild West of lenses and optics that you'll be hearing about later today, in the sense that when we consider lenses, we consider more than just a collection of, say, morphisms in a category that type check and fit together in some way. We also want some additional 
uh, relations to hold between the components of our lenses. Joella? And when we say category based, well, and this is, this is from the, the history of lenses as this, uh, as this tool for thinking about databases. If we're thinking about states, and if we allow any state to move on to any other state, then we can model our set of, we can consider sets of states. But it may be the case that the, the sort of allowed transitions depend on whatever state you're already in. And it may be the case that there are multiple transitions between two distinct states that you want to keep track of, in which case it becomes more natural to start modeling your state space as a category. So instead of, so, so we're using uh, categories as our models for state spaces here. And we say asymmetric, this is, also, this is also another database term, but when we say a symmetric lens, we mean to say this tool that synchronizes two systems, both of which may know something that the other doesn't. And an asymmetric one is one in which one is sort of the mother and the other is the child. And the mother knows everything and then the child knows a bit of that. And the point is that uh, we can always construct, uh, we can always con construct symmetric lenses out of spans of asymmetric lenses. Joelle? No, 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 that's, no, no, that's, yeah. Oh, wait, could you go up? Back? Look, sorry, the question was, is there a typo? So, so yeah, you One knows everything the other does. Yep. That's asymmetric, I know, it, it's a terminology thing. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Uh, right, so all in all, when we say lawful, we're, we're talking about a special class of lenses that are quite nice. And when we talk about this uh, category-based lens, we're talking about uh, a generalization. So all in all, we're talking about a nice and general class of lenses that are quite sufficient to model this domain of problems that we consider synchronization interoperation. Next, Joelle. So here is the formal definition of a lens. So a lens is, uh, consists of a get, F here, which is a functor that goes from a category A to B, equipped with this lifting operation. And this lifting operation is doing what I was trying to illustrate earlier, trying to pick something in the fiber over the domain of the, of the get and uh, taking a pair of that and an arrow coming out of the domain so that you, so that you, can, so you can lift it. You can pick a lift. Well, let's, let's illustrate that, Jolyn. Okay, let's try this again. We've got two categories, A and B, Jolyn. Pick some object. Fine, say A and A, drill it. Okay, so this functor F, that's going to map down A and a bunch of other things to FA. This is the, this is the action on objects of our get. Drill it. Okay, now let's describe what this put is trying to do, this lifting. Well, okay, now we take some arrow, any arrow, U, that comes out of FA, drill it. Okay, we know that what we ask for is that the codomain of this arrow U is in the image of the functor F, Julie. And then we say, okay, all this lift is doing is we're going to take this phi of A, the object that we started from and go down and uh, U. And all in all, what this lifting is doing is drawing out the graph of a function. What we want to do is take for every element in the fiber over FA, Given you downstairs, we want to pick a lift that starts at some chosen element A. And what that comes out to be is the graph of a function in A. All right? Next, really? Okay, so now we can build on this picture to describe to you what these laws are that govern these lenses. Uh, okay, so slogan wise, here they are. Um, so put followed by get is trivial for morphisms. Get followed by put preserves identities and the put of composites is the composite of puts. And again, this is better illustrated so you can get a feel for what these equations are saying. So, okay, this first one, what's that saying? Get followed by put, or put followed by, put followed by get. So you put, you take a U and you use this lifting to put and go up and you follow that by a get, it had better end up in the same place that it started. So this is a niceness condition. Next, Joelle. We want to put and get to respect objects. 
closest thing we can do here is we can say, okay, well, you'd better respect these identity morphisms. What are you doing? Well, okay, if you, if you do a put of an identity morphism, sorry, if you do a get of uh, an identity morphism going down and you do a lifting, which is a put, all that better work out that you, you end up in the same place. Next, Joey. Finally, the, the, the put of composites is the composite of puts. Oh, this is hopefully the diagram is uh, self-explanatory. Say that if you have a, if you want to lift a composite morphism downstairs, well, it better be that whatever you end up lifting it to is the composite of the lifts of the components, U and V, All right? Okay. So all that is a bit hard to swallow. There's a lot of information. And one of the important tricks that we had to internalize to really get to studying this category was this massive simplification found by Bryce. The fact that any lens could be represented as a commuting diagram of functors in this way, with a left leg identity and faithful on objects and a right leg, a discrete off vibration. Why is that the case? Well. Let's, I'm going to give you the intuition now for why this is the case. We're going to build on the picture that we had before. So this last slide that we had before, where I said we were drawing, a, we were drawing the graph of a function in the domain category. Well, that act of doing that, Jolene, that's, that's what a discrete off vibration is. So what we can do is take a new category, lambda, and set that to be the apex. Give it the same objects as A, and then draw out the choices that we want the lens to make for the lifts there as the graph of the function. This gives you a discrete off vibration. There's only one unique lift that you can possibly get for, for every U. Okay, Joelle? And then you embed that, you embed these choices back down into A with an identity on objects, faithful functor. And what that does is that highlights all the choices that you've made. So this representation theorem that the, of, of a commuting triangle is really just formalizing this intuition that we're really trying to use this lens to make choices for you. Great. Jolie? And finally, it turns out that if you want all these laws to hold, all you're asking for is that this get, final part of the, final part of the puzzle, this get that goes from A to B, commutes with everything, and that's it. Really? Yeah, so there's, the, there's a nice picture. And it turns out that, uh, it turns out, oh, go back for a second. And it turns out that this, this orange span up here, that's a cofunctor. So there's a very nice characterization of these lenses as an interacting functor and cofunctor. All cofunctors can be represented as a span of functors, highlighted in orange, in this way. All right, <clears throat> Jolie? So now the category that we, that we looked at, and it's surprising because this definition is 10 years old, but it's barely been studied, even though this is an extremely broad class of mathematical objects. And the reason is because um, it just didn't seem that interesting, much like Cambridge. They said, well, we can't find products here. I mean, what can you expect of a category that doesn't have product? And like Cambridge, it became a lot more interesting after a bunch of applied category theorists came, but unlike Cambridge, uh, lens will be interesting even after we leave. So this is the category. And what did we find? Well, we started by saying, well, let's look for the simple stuff. Okay. We found some initial and terminal object. That's pretty good. Surely. We found all small co-products. Okay. So maybe you don't have your limits, but Maybe there's something you can say about the co-limits here. That's pretty interesting. Next, Charlie. We found equalizers. It's pretty good. And we even went so far to find an orthogonal, an orthogonal factorization system, which turns out, uh, and as, as when I pass it to Joel later, you, you'll see why this, why this thing justifies a lot of what engineers do in the day-to-day. Really? And in the end, we managed to say something about the missing limits or the limits that weren't there. We found that, yes, fine, we don't have limits because they, they really don't like satisfying this, this universal property. But we find that in basically every other way you would want a limit to be a limit, they 
they behave like them. We have that these products that don't exist, well, they, 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 they distribute over the co-products. We even have real extensivity. Really? Uh, and as you'll learn in the next talk uh, by Matt DiMelio, there are certain co-equalizers as well. It turns out this category that uh, nobody really thought was, you know, had all this structure, it, it gave us a, a wonderful surprise. Uh, and it turned out to be to be very rich, and all this was enabled by the kinds of abstractions that we adopted. So we we were able to really take this simplified picture and use that simplification to investigate this category, really starting from scratch, the the six of us. And um, yeah, I think that's my half. So I'm going to hand it over to Joelle. It's amazing to think that we haven't actually met because. No, I consider him a good friend because we've been talking for a year and working on this. And Joelle, engineer that he is, is going to illustrate the consequences of some of these structures by giving concrete examples of what you can use lenses for. Okay, take it away, Joelle. Thank you very much, Vincent. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here, even if it's virtual. We thought in the spirit of a hybrid conference to have a hybrid talk. So I'm here in Zurich. Um, and I'm not getting engaged yet, so I hope my app doesn't get interrupted by some music or something in case, uh, in case it's happening, let me know. Um, all right, so uh, as Vince said, this slide that we have up now is kind of a spoiler of, all, of most of the results you actually find in the paper, and you're welcome to go through them and, and we can discuss in the next uh, days. But uh, we thought that a, a good way to give you a taste of some of those results is to actually show them uh, active in place in a, in a common setting. And this setting uh, that we are looking at is the setting of co-design or design, which is a very applied thing, right? Uh, and uh, what I'm gonna do in the next slides is first uh, provide a, a overview of this setting. Uh, so describing some, some definitions or some, some first points, and then I will show you how this setting is very good to illustrate some, some of the concept we talked about. So first of all, we need to talk about design and we will characterize design uh, or a design problem uh, with three spaces. The first space is uh, the obvious one, is called the implementation space, and it's the space that actually contains the options that you can choose from when willing to design something. Now, uh, usually when you design a component or a algorithm or any, anything, you, you aim at obtaining a, a specific functionality and that's characterized by the functionality space. Now, unfortunately, uh, functionalities or functions don't come for free and therefore you have some requirements of or some costs uh, to pay. Now, if you think about buying a car, uh, a specific car, so choosing between specific car models, you can think of a functionality as being the speed. So you want the car to be very fast maybe, but uh, this speed will come at a cost. And that's the, the price to pay, uh, the requirements. Similarly, if you buy some batteries, uh, usually you care about uh, having a capacity and a maximum current that the, uh, that the battery can provide. And this too comes at the cost of having uh, a mass and usually a monetary cost to pay. Now. To, to actually formalize this a bit better, we can describe a design problem with implementation with this tuple in which you have two spaces, the functionality space and the requirement space, which are not just sets, but are posets. And we do this in order to uh, actually characterize uh, differences between uh, functionalities and requirements and to actually include an order between them or even an indifference between some, some of them. Then we have the implementation space, which is, the, which is called I. And then we have two maps that map each implementation to the specific, specific functionality and resources it requires and provides. So for instance, if you think about the car model, that would be a, a point in this uh, set here. And uh, we will have um, two maps that map this, uh, this implementation to the specific uh, speed it gets to and to the specific cost it has. Now, if it's if one on one end is true that engineers uh, uh, that design and engineers need really the implementations because you need to know how something is done uh, for the algorithmic solution of such co-design problems we can consider feasibility relations. What does it mean? It simply means that we can drop the implementation part 
and consider Boolean profunctors. So we describe uh, a design problem as a Boolean profunctor, which simply means we have a functor between this, the product of these two posits. We have f op and r. So the functionality space opt, and the op will be clear in a minute, and r, so the requirement space. And those map to bool. And bool is the pre-order with the false and true as the two elements and an arrow between them, um, characterizing the, the false to true uh, relation. Now, uh, the, what does it mean to evaluate this Boolean profunctor on a specific functionality and a specific resource? Well, we are answering the question, does it exist an implementation in the implementation space such that I get at least the functionality I want by requiring at most uh, the, the uh, requirements I have or the cost I am able to, to afford, right? And this is a monotone map. So this is really a morphism in the category of posits because uh, if you lower the functionalities, you won't require more. Re uh, you you won't require more requirements, and if you are, have uh, higher requirements, so if you suddenly become richer, you will not provide less functionalities, right? And that's why uh, we have this up here to really consider this as a monotone map. And now I won't go into the details, but these design problems or these boolean profunctors uh, form a very nice category that we call DP. And through this category, we are able to, to model very complex engineering problems. Uh, and we, we also provide some, some nice ways to solve them. And we cover all these things uh, in a separate course that we are offering, which is called Applied Compositional Thinking for Engineers. So that's a kind of advertising moment. Right, so why am I talking about this? Uh, we are not going to now look at a specific example of design problem. And subsequently, we are going to look at why this can be seen as an example of lens. Now, consider the, the design problem related to buying a car. And the acquisition of this car uh, is done by considering the speed that the car has. So let's have here three cars. We have a tractor, a average speed car, and a very quick car. And we consider, therefore, the two uh, partial orders to describe the functionalities and the resources very simply. We have slow, average, and fast for the cars, and we have cheap and expensive. Of course, those are, those are even uh, total orders, but that's going to that's gonna be OK for, for the sake of the example. And we specify the feasibility relation between the, all these uh, functionalities and resources by stating the slow vehicles are the only cheap ones, and all the rest are expensive. What does it mean? It means if I want to buy a tractor and I want it cheap, that's going to be feasible. But as soon as I want uh, to buy an average car or a, a quick car that's going to be expensive. And now, how does this connect to the first half of the talk? Well, we can think about this Boolean profunctor as being the uh, get part of our lens. So we can represent the functor uh, fiber-wise. So you see on the bottom, I have false and true. And I can put a bubbles of pairs in f of times r uh, for uh, pairs of functionality and requirements which are feasible, and functionality and requirements pairs which are not feasible. For instance, here you see that it's not feasible to get a fast car and get it cheap, and it's not feasible to get an average car and get it cheap. On the other end, it's very it's possible to have a slow car and have it cheap, and it's even possible to have a slow car and have it expensive, right? Nobody prevents you from paying more than what's requested. Now, in this context, what's a lens? So we said we have the get, but what, what does the put do on this, uh, on this specific structure? Well, uh, if we put a lens over this functor, we have a unique way in which we can map a pair in f op times r uh, from being unfeasible to being feasible. So in some sense, we can say that the model, uh, the lens models the feasibility and informs the compromises to make the unfeasible feasible. As an example here, you see we have a fast car and, and we want it cheap. That's not feasible. Well, a lens, a particular lens, will give us a strategy to move from unfeasible to feasible, and that could be to become richer, right? Similarly, from the average and cheap, uh, we could uh, in increase our our uh, uh, wealth to to be able to buy it. Another lens could be, for instance, to reduce our expectations, right? I want a fast car and I want it cheap. No, actually. The lens is suggesting you to be less picky and accept a slow car, and you will have it cheap, right? So that, that's what the lens. Uh, that's why we can see design problems and lenses. Now, 
that the setting is clear, we can talk about some of the constructions we discovered in the, in the paper. The first one uh, that we want to describe is the one about co-products. So uh, for this, uh, as you remember, uh, you, you, you need to consider two lenses. Uh, these two lenses need to have the same codomain, in this case, B. And uh, we, we are gonna be able to construct these co-products in lens. And I just want to give you here an intuition. So first of all, uh, we said that lenses are characterized by get functors. So we have a functorial part of, of the lens and, uh, and that's very similar to the category of categories as you will read in, in our paper. So the first step is that given two such lenses, we can first start by taking the co-product in cat and that would be A plus C. Now, uh, given this uh, thing, we can actually uh, construct the do the universal construction and, uh, and uh, write down what the commuting diagram is for, for the co-products. And I want to, to give you the example of design problems that you, we just saw together to give you kind of the intuition of that, what this uh, design, uh, this co-product is in the sense of design problems. Now, uh, let's consider, we, we need to consider two design problems which have the same codomain. But that's kind of easy because co-design problems all map to bool, right? Those are functors that map to bool, are feasibility relations. So let's consider in, in the setting of the car, a uh, feasibility relation between speed and cost, that's the one we already saw, and the, another one between seats and weights, right? By increasing the seats, I might increase the weight of the car. Well, what would be the co-product of those two? That would be a lens that uh, is, is between speed up times cost uh, plus seat up times weight to bull. And that models the fact that we, that we can either have a feasibility relation between speed and cost or a feasibility relation between uh, seats and weight. Uh, those two are not interacting. We are not mixing them, but we are modeling the fact that we have these two things happening uh, at the same time. And one of the two can be chosen. Now we can, with this in mind, we can move on to the next example, which I find very interesting. And is the one about uh, equalizers. Again, the strategy is to consider what we already know in the category of categories. So if we consider two lenses, which have the same domain and codomain, let's take F and phi and G and gamma here. One can first construct the equalizer uh, of the underlying functors in the category of categories. And then in the paper, we really describe the precise way in which we can write down uh, the, the equalizer in the category of lenses. And again, the example should really uh, show in simple terms uh, how this works. Now consider two design problems. And if you think about it, a design problem could be thought of as an expert that's telling you what's feasible and what's not feasible. Now, if you have two design problems with the same domain and codomain, that can be thought of having two different experts of a common field of, or of a common uh, expertise. And, uh, and they are telling you two different things, right? What would be the equalizers in this setting? Well, uh, the equalizer uh, is a, something that actually embeds um, the, so, so it's something that selects the pairs in F op times R for which the two experts agree. So let's see the, the example below. In, uh, in the left, we have the, the first uh, design problem that we were uh, looking at the first in the previous slides. And on the right, we have a slightly different one. In particular, this expert or this design problem has a different view on having fast and expensive cars. It says that that's not even possible. You would need even more money than expensive to, to buy this uh, uh, fast car. All right. So, what would the equalizer do? Well, it would select the pairs for which the, the experts agree. And those pairs are the one depicted in blue. Of course, it might be the case that uh, the, the experts never agree, right? That you have total disagreement. Of course, that's not what you want as an engineer. You would like to select the common denominator between the two. Uh, but for sure, uh, that could be the case of total disagreement and that could be described by the trivial equalizer. All right, the final example we show you is the one about the orthogonal factorization system. And that was pretty enlightening as an engineer uh, because it's essentially uh, tells you that if you're focusing on so only on a certain part of a problem without knowing that there exists another structure, uh, well, the, orthogonal factoriz the existence of the orthogonal factorization system actually saves the day and, uh, and uh, let's say saves your ignorance as an engineer about the other structure. Let's see about, let's see, let's see what this is about. So 
we want to recall that first uh, Johnson and Rosbra first showed that Lance admits a proper octogonal, octogonal factorization system back in the days. So that's not a, pro, a result of the paper per se. What we actually show in the paper is that we, we really characterize the, the structure of the orthogonal factorization system in saying that there is an epimono factorization system uh, and every lens can be factored into a surjective on object lens that we call epimorphism and a cursive or a monomorphism. But again, let's look at a practical example to see what this means. Um, let's consider a practical case. Let's consider you are a car seller and you have to consider this uh, uh, feasibility relation between speed and cost. Now, it's uh, probably as a car seller, you think about the true values of this uh, feasibility relation. So you usually you focus about what you can do and not what you cannot do, right? So let's say that this uh, uh, feasibility relation only maps to true. Uh, so if I, if I look at this diagram, this lens here is written this way because we know that it maps to bull. But in reality, the, the car seller doesn't have a clue about the false part. It just knows that this is true. Can he do that? Can he just uh, uh, consider the true part? Well, our orthogonal factorization system says yes, because we can factor our, um, our uh, uh, lens into a epimorphism, so a surjective on, ob on objects lens that only maps to true. That would be the uh, the ignorant part of the car seller. And then we have a formal way in which we can embed this true into the actual bool, which is through this monomorphism. Okay, so the day is safe. And actually, it's, it is our interest to go and look for more, uh, let's say, relevant also engineering examples to actually contextualize this, because we have the feeling that this is happening very often in engineering, that we consider just uh, the part, the subset of the problem that is interesting for us, uh, but actually this subset is part of something bigger, right? All right, uh, that brings me to the conclusion of this kind of uh, uh, example-oriented part. And I want to wrap up uh, and, and uh, discuss what we did. So we, we considered nice but general lenses. Uh, and those lenses we have shown you through different examples that are able to model synchronization, coordination, and interoperation. So they are really amenable for, for applications. We studied the uh, category. And uh, as Vince said, we studied this uh, in a very unbiased way, trying to look for structure that was not found before. And uh, as you see, we found some of this structure. Now, one might ask, what's next? Well, next is uh, to find uh, more structure, for sure. And, uh, and uh, I'm happy, we are all happy, I guess, to discuss in the next days or in the next weeks about some of the structure. But also, we want to find uh, more examples uh, in which our constructions can be showcased and also that can highlight why it is important to know about the existence of these constructions. Finally, a final remark is that, as Vincent said, this was a great opportunity given us by the adjoint school. So if you're thinking about joining the adjoint school next year, definitely do it. Uh, I'm sure we had a great experience even being on, on virtual mode, uh, uh, working between three continents, uh, four time zones. So I guess if you are able to do this in person, it will be even better. But uh, I'm really glad that we had this opportunity. And uh, thank you all for the, for the attention. Okay, thank you very much, Vincent and, and Julie. Um, I see we have some questions online. Are there also any questions in the audience? Then we need to decide how to, who is going to field which questions. So maybe we can I see somebody moving in the audience. Let me unmute that. Did That's me? Jules, I think. Go ahead. Okay. Hi. Um, so I'm speaking as the author of a retracted preprint that you may know uh, that incorrectly proved that set-based lawless lenses have equalizers. And I, I think this isn't true now. Um, do you have some high-level intuition or explanation of why this is true for delta lenses and not true in set-based lawless. Is, do you think this is because they're category-based or because they're lawful, or do you really need both of these things together to make this to make this work? This maybe is a difficult technical question. Um, that is a really nice question. I think that 
Probably, okay, so, so probably both of those things, right? Because the, the, the driving engine of our, uh, of our proof technique is this representation theorem of lenses as these commuting triangles of functors, which requires both the category-based view and the lawfulness in order to get. And then once you have that, you can do diagram chases, but for every edge, you draw like two more, the, the, the cofunctor part, the span, and then you can, you can reason about these things and you, so, so, and you can find a lot more than you would otherwise have if you, if you only had a sort of a glossing here, an internal view of what, what, you, what each lens was doing. So I think that's, um, that's, that's the intuition as I understand it. Um, and perhaps if Mike and Bryce are online, they can, they can add some more and amend what we're saying here. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Jules. Thanks. Okay, then there's a question from Jeremy Gibbons. Could you unmute yourself and ask it, Jeremy? Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, that was a very nice talk, both halves of it. Um, and uh, I like the paper as well. But I'm a bit puzzled about the, I, I really like the design problem um, setting, which gives some concrete intuition. But is, is that a, um, a, a lawful lens that you're using there? It seems to me that when you get uh, from a, an infeasible state and put, straight, put it back again, you move into a different state, a feasible one. The, the put makes things feasible. So therefore neither get put nor put get, as I understand it is satisfied is, is uh, so what am I, what am I missing? Uh -huh. so, um, so, you, so you're saying that if you start in an infeasible state and you, and you send it down, and then you lift it back up, you might not end up where you were before. Is that correct? Correct. correct. And conversely, <laughs> if you start from the bottom and uh, go up and come back down again, you might not end up where you, where you were before. All right. Um, I admit it was confusing as well coming from coming from set based lenses and understanding put put and put get because we have three axioms here and they have a certain familial resemblance to the put get and get get and, and put put but. Um, in this case, I think that this first example that you're saying where you, you take something in an infeasible state. And you map it down if you don't do anything if you're just staying at the at the bottom and you do an you do an identity and then you lift it back up the put identity law as we have it tells you, okay, well, you have to go back to where you came from. So that's an infeasible, an infeasible design problem if you started with an infeasible design problem. Yes, yeah, so if you start with an infeasible design and you made no effort to go from uh, the, the, the falseness, the, the inability to do anything to true, then sure, you go back up, you're, you're still infeasible. Yeah. It's, the, it's the, the coordination magic, I suppose, happens when you try to make moves away to different valuations of, of where you are. Yeah. In that, okay. in that design space. All right, thank you. Yeah. I have another question as well, Chris, if I may, but I'll cede the floor if somebody else has questions. Yeah, let's There's uh, another question. There's somebody in audience. the audience. Yeah, let's do that one first. I hope this is a quick question, but was the choice of having Booleans as your interface, was there something special about Booleans or could you say have like numbers from zero to one as having, um, I don't know, implementations that are partially feasible or something. Brilliant, brilliant question. Um, well, Booleans are special because they're really easy to think about, but you're absolutely right that you, that's, that's, not, a, that's not something special about So you bool. didn't need you to use it. properties of specifically the Booleans to get most of these results? Yes, of course, okay. of course. So all of this about design problems was just a uh, feel for intuition. Okay. So as the results are presented in the paper, if you, if you're not, if you don't want that intuition, you don't need to buy it. You can go ahead and just read the paper. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if I may add, uh, Vince, um, I think there are two different questions related to this, which is uh, from the practical point, without thinking about lenses, there might be very, it might be very interesting to look at something different from Booleans. Maybe you want to characterize uh, something in between, right? It's very feasible, it's eh, not sure, or it's totally unfeasible, or even you want to characterize some other performance metrics inside this, this uh, evaluation. Um, but yeah, we didn't, let's say, we didn't investigate it for the case of lens. That would be for sure something to, to do, if, if that would still uh, uh, be a good example of what we discovered. Let's put it this way. But thank you for the question. That's a very good one. OK, Jeremy, do you want to ask your second question? It was precisely that question that was just asked. Um, but then perhaps maybe what, what are the, um, what's the factorization when it's, it's not just a, a Boolean uh, feasibility, but you have some degrees of compromise as well. 
That's a very good question. Um, and uh, to be honest, we discussed this uh, and we didn't, I mean, I guess we didn't have enough time to discuss this, uh, but that's that's something we want to, to investigate. That's very good food for thought. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Good. There's, there's another question here, if we can take that one. All right, so, let's do that as the last one. So I had two questions. The first one was the one about, can you replace Boolean by a quantile or something? Another quantile. Uh, yeah, and then, but then tying this in with the adjunct school this year, I mean, so just the, the concept lattice of this procomptor appear anywhere in what's going on. Sorry, could you repeat that in here? This could uh, the, con, the con, so you've got this, this uh, relation. Yes, um, right. So this Boolean value procomptor, does the concept lattice of that make an appearance? It's a concept lattice, that, wow, really. <sighs> we haven't. I think this this ties back a little bit. That's a that's a you know brilliant direction, but that, that's that ties back a little to what Joella is saying, saying that um, we want to see what other structures seem natural to kind of view these view these lenses with and view this category of lenses with. Um, so no, we we haven't thought about it uh, for uh, to use it as a concept for concept yeah, modeling, yeah. form of concept analysis. Because I mean, okay. I guess that's what we were doing in the in the adjunct school this year was mm. was looking at those sorts of things when we do replace bool by by mm. one time. So, yeah, it could be quite fruitful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Okay. Any more questions in the hall? No. Then. Um, I'm going to ask you all to unmute yourselves so we can thank everyone properly by clapping. Thank you very much. Thank you. So then we're going to go to the next talk by Matti Megliu, um, sort of on a continuation. It has already been advertised. And Matt is a co-host, so you should be able to share a screen. Does that work for you, Matt? Does that work? Perfect. I can see it. OK, awesome. so as mentioned, the next talk by Matti Megliu, co-equalizers under the lens. Take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. And I'd also like to thank the organizers of the conference for giving me this awesome opportunity to present to you all today. So today I'll also be talking about lenses and the same kind of lenses as were discussed in the previous talk. So I'll start by recapping the, what, what lenses are and what the category of uh, lenses is. And then I'll go on to talk about some of the results that I've discovered about uh, epis and co-equalizers in the category of lenses. Okay. so. What is a lens? I mean, we saw lots of examples of lenses in the previous talk, but maybe I'll give you a different perspective on what, what a lens is. So I guess in lenses came about from a, in a very applied way. So there were a bunch of computer scientists who were interested in studying these things called, uh, which they called bidirectional transformations. So, I mean, a bidirectional transformation is, uh, uh, a situation where you have two systems that are interacting and you want to you want to keep them in in sync and so in order to model these bidirectional transformations that they were finding in computer science um, these re researchers uh, invented various uh, mathematical structures which they called lenses in order in order to model these things and so the kind of lenses we're talking about which are known as asymmetric delta lenses in the literature were introduced by Zenobi Diskin uh, a number of years ago. So uh, what do I wanna say? So, so these, these uh, bidirectional transformations are modeling, another name for it would be a synchronization protocol between two systems. So for instance, uh, you might think of uh, one system as being a database, for instance, uh, the database at a school, and the other system might be a, a view of that database. 
So for instance, a teacher might have a view of the school database, which uh, has information about the students in their classes and lets them put the role in and stuff like that. And so uh, uh, systems in double lenses are, are modeled as, as categories. So uh, the states, so in the database example, the state of the database would be the collection of all of the records in uh, the database at a given moment in time. Uh, so they, they, they're gonna be modeled by objects of, of the, the category and the, the transitions. So in the database example, transitions might include inserting records, updating records, deleting records. So these are going to be modeled by the, the morphisms of the categories. And so uh, if we model systems as categories, then uh, our synchronization protocols are going to be modeled as these delta lens things. And in the database example, uh, the synchronization protocol might be called a solution to this so-called view update problem. So you have, um, so you have your school database the, containing the information for all, for, for the whole school. And I mean, for each state of that database, there's a way to produce uh, uh, a given view for a given teacher, but then the teacher makes a change to their view. And the question is, how, how do you uh, make a change to the whole database to, to bring it in line in consistency with the change that the teacher made? And so that, that would be a, a solution to this view update problem. And you would model that situation with a Delta lens. Okay. So let's actually have a look at a formal definition. And I mean, this is going to be very similar to, well, I mean, it's the same definition, but just maybe presented with slightly different notation to what we saw in the previous talk. So a lens F from a category A to a category B consists of two pieces of data. So a functor F from A to B, which we're going to call the get functor of the lens. And for each object A in A, and for each morphism B in B that goes out of F of A to some object, I don't really care what that object is, but to some object, there's going to be a chosen lift of B to A. So the chosen lift I'm going to denote by F superscript A of B, and it's a morphism out of A to some other object in A. And this, this data has to satisfy three laws. So the first law is often called put get. So if I start with uh, an object A and A and a morphism B out of F of A, and I lift it to A, and then I put it back down using the, the functor, I should get back to what I started with. So the put id law says, if I put the identity, I get the identity. And the put put law says, if I put the, the composite of two morphisms, that's the same thing as putting first putting the, the first morphism and then uh, lifting the second morphism to the target of the first. So those two things should agree. So, and as was noted in the, in the previous talk, if you know what a cofunctor is, and by cofunctor, we're not talking about contravariant functor, we're talking about some other notion that's actually uh, come up in a number of places in applied category theory recently. Um, so the, the lifts here, together with the object map of the, the, the get functor, uh, form a cofunctor from these put id and put put laws. So they're the cofunctoriality laws. And then this put get law is the thing that says that the, the, the cofunctor and the functor agree, or the, the lifts and the, and, the, and the functor agree. Okay. So small categories and lenses form a category called, uh, which, which I'm going to call lens. And I mean, as a, as a category theorist, when we, we have a category, uh, it's natural to ask questions about what are the, the limits and co-limits, the epis, the monos, all, all of these kinds of things. And so Cholet et al, so that's the, the group that presented the, the previous talk from the adjoint school last year. So they initiated a study of the categorical properties of lens. So uh, some of the things that they explored were equalizers and, and co-products and these things that they've called imported uh, pullbacks. And I guess, um, so prior to, to their work, I guess there was no reason to expect that lens 
would, would have nice properties because, I mean, these morphisms, they're functors, but with this extra structure that seems, seemed a bit ad hoc. And the kind of the, the, the computer science researchers who invented them sort of, you know, they, they, they suspected there wouldn't, wouldn't be anything nice to say about this category. But as, as uh, Cholet et al. discovered, there are some uh, nice aspects of this category lens. Now, uh, one thing that I think was quite useful to Cholet et al. and was also useful to, to me was considering this functor U from lens to cat which sends a lens to its get functor. So thinking about uh, you know, the limits and co-limits in cat and how they might be able to be lifted to, to, to things in lens. So for instance, uh, in the previous talk, we saw that this forgetful functor creates co-products. So where my work started was earlier this year, uh, Bryce Clark actually presented to the Australian category seminar, the, the the progress that uh, the, the previous group had made in, in, from their work in the adjoint school and beyond. And he stated some conjectures about uh, characterizing the, the monos and the, the epis in, in, in lens. And after thinking about those conjectures, I actually managed to, to prove the thing about the monos. And I guess Steve, Steve Lack was uh, the first one to sort of come up with a sketch of the of, of a proof for the, the epi conjecture, but then I came up with another proof, which I think is maybe slightly simpler than Steve's. So this is where my work began. And I guess where it went from there is having this, this characterization of the epis in lens allowed, was sort of gave an approach of attack for actually thinking about uh, co-equalizers in lens, as we'll see in a moment. So I guess that's where the sort of the, the background of the talk ends and we actually start getting into the, the, the you know, the, the new stuff, the in interesting stuff. So the main takeaway of this slide is that the epis in lens are going to be, uh, are nicer than, than the epis in cat. So I hope most of us are familiar with the notion of, a, of an epic morphism. It's one which is right cancelable. Now in cat, uh, we have this, I guess, partial characterization of the epic functors. So every subjective on objects and subjective on morphisms functor is epic, but uh, the, the converse doesn't completely hold. So it's true that every epic functor is subjective on objects, but uh, it's not true in general that every epic, morph uh, every epic functor is subjective on morphisms. So we have this partial characterization, but the situation in lens is much nicer. So uh, I guess this is a result, which is a, a combination of, you know, Cholet et al's work and I guess Steve Wack's proof or, or my, my proof. So the, the epis in, uh, so it's, it's equivalent, the following are, are equivalent. Uh, uh, a lens is epic, a lens is subjective on objects and a lens is subjective on morphisms. And so this, this is quite a nice, uh, characterization of the, the epic uh, lenses. And this, this, proper, this, this, this result it was, I mean, was essential to all of the things that I did in my paper with respect to co-equalizers. Okay, so again, I also hope that most of us in the audience are familiar with the notion of a co-equalizer. So uh, morphism E co-equalizes a parallel pair F1 and F2 if it's their universal cofork. Now, uh, we know that cat is uh, co-complete, and so in particular, cat has co-equalizers. But uh, the co-equalizers in cat, in general, aren't so nice to describe. So in certain circumstances, they they are. But in general, if you are asked to calculate a co-equalizer, it's it's not really a nice thing to do. So in contrast, uh, as we'll see in a moment, lens doesn't have all. Uh, co-equalizers. It does have some, and actually uh, some are, in, well, I mean, ones that you can compare to the ones in CAT, some are nicer to describe than the ones in CAT, and we'll see, see uh, some, some results in a moment which, which highlights this. And as I said before, so the reason why that epi result gave an in on studying co-equalizers is because co-equalizers are always epic. Okay. So 
uh, I said that not all co-equalizers in lens exist. And here I've depicted an example of a parallel pair of lenses with no co-equalizer. So in, in, in the diagram here, I've depicted the functor action just by the alignment of the objects and morphisms and the lifts I've depicted using some, some coloring. Now, I don't really have time to, to go through a, a proof here, but I guess maybe uh, just sort of uh, this, this, this morphism F here, which isn't a lift of any morphisms in B, because F1 sends it to F1 prime and F2 sends it to F2 prime, it means that F1 prime and F2 prime get glued in the, in, in the co, uh, well, if there were a co-equalizer, they would have to be glued together. And then I guess the, 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 the proof proceeds from there, but that, that's sort of the, 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 the starting point for why these two lenses don't have a co-equalizer. Um, but I don't have time to say more. So I guess that was a, a, a negative result, but, but I do have some positive results, which I think were quite surprising to me, especially this, this first one. So uh, the result says that every epic lens co-equalizes its imported kernel pair in lens. I guess we should start with kernel pair. So if you have a morphism in a category, it's kernel pair is the pullback of the morphism along itself. Now, what does this imported mean? I mean, it was briefly touched on in the previous talk. Essentially, so if you have a, a, a lens and you look at its uh, get functor, well, that get functor will have a kernel pair in cat. And there's a canonical way to put a lens structure on the, the projection functors to produce uh, a commuting diagram in lens, except for the fact that this commuting diagram in lens doesn't satisfy the, the universal property that you, you would ask uh, a kernel pair to satisfy. Nonetheless, uh, this imported kernel pair is the, the analog for kernel pair in lens. And it turns out that every epic lens co-equalizes its imported kernel pair. And that's quite surprising because the corresponding result in cat doesn't hold. So in CAT, it's not true that every functor co-equalizes its kernel pair. Um, and so I thought I found that quite, quite interesting. And as a consequence, you can also deduce things like the uh, lenses which are left orthogonal to all monic lenses are precisely the epic lenses, which is part of this, uh, well, which gives part of the, the result mentioned in the previous talk about the orthogonal factorization system. Um, so the other result about classes of co-equalizers in lens is this one, which says that this forgetful functor U creates pushouts of monic lenses with discrete op vibrations. And uh, this really is about co-equalizers because as we saw in the previous talk, lens has co-products. So pushouts are co-equalizers. So I'm not gonna say much more there. Uh, instead, I'm going to go to the conclusion and so, I mean, here's a summary of some of the things that I mentioned in the talk, but I think the main takeaway is, although uh, going into this, we kind of expected that lens uh, wouldn't have such nice categorical properties because of the ad hoc nature of the, the, the lifts on, on, the, on the morphisms, it, it turned out that in, in some ways, lens is actually perhaps even nicer than, than, than cat. So I'm gonna end my talk there and, yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, do we have some questions in the audience? If, while you're thinking- uh, no, uh, you Oh, yes, there is one question here. Go ahead. So, so I, I've got a general question to anybody uh, from the last two talks, really. Um, so it's, it seems to me that, that actually looking at the category of lenses, so in other words, you're looking at composing the, these um, uh, functors uh, with extra structure isn't quite the right thing to do. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, from an external point of view, so I'm sort of seeing this kind of pretty much for the first time, actually, I think they look like a certain kind of vibration. So to me, the natural thing to do would be you'd, you'd look at not at the category of lenses, but the category of categories with that notion of, of vibration, that the notion of lens is giving you and look at, at properties of that, that. So that's sort of telling you a, a notion of, if you like, um, 
smallness or whatever of, of certain kinds of categories internally in the category of categories given by that notion of vibration. So uh, I guess that's what the factorization um, result is, is sort of uh, telling you that, that, yeah. So, so I, I don't know, it's not really a question, it's just a comment. And it seems to me that maybe lens as a category isn't necessarily quite the right thing to be looking at. I mean, I don't know what to say. I guess uh, lenses in some sense generalize uh, vibrations. I mean, and in some sense, I guess split up vibrations are really nice kinds of lenses. So they're, they're not, I guess they're not entirely the, the same concept, but they're definitely closely re related. Um, it looks like Mike has unmuted himself, which suggests that Mike has something to say about this. So maybe I'll let Mike say something too. <laughs> So yes, indeed, um, I uh, like what Andy's saying and, and you're right. Um, the reason for looking at the category lens is because a lot of the applications depend upon that category. That's where the compositionality is relevant. Um, but the real reason I unmuted myself was because I was going to ask Bryce if he'd like to unmute himself and comment on that. Out of the kind of six of us or so who were here, I thought Bryce might be the person who might be best placed. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> I can say something about that. So, um, yeah, as Matt was saying, and as Mike mentioned, uh, yeah, I mean, split op vibrations are very nice uh, lenses where this these chosen lifts are actually op Cartesian. And so um, I guess one of the reasons why you might want to study this category of lenses is that uh, a lot of the things that happen to be true for vibrations and so on uh, are more generally true for lenses. And uh, with lenses, we have this nice... Uh, this nice structure that we sort of uh, can carry around and prove a lot of results just at this more general level than vibrations. Um, but you're also right in the sense that uh, maybe the category of uh, categories and lenses, uh, as and whether lenses are the morphisms, isn't perhaps the right thing to look at. And uh, in more recent work uh, with myself and some other uh, people in this area, have been looking at uh, analogues of lenses over a fixed uh, category in the same way that you'd look at uh, split up vibrations over a, a fixed category or the category of, uh, of all the functor category from, from a category into cat, for instance. So, uh, so yeah, there's, there's, there's several different directions going on there, but uh, definitely looking closely at the relationship between uh, vibrations. Think, and think, thinking about it, I, I think I can, I can, I can um, uh, focus on, on an actual question. So, so um, if you're thinking of the notion of lens as, as somehow kind of a vibrant notion, is, is there is there a, is there a um, is there a notion of co-vibration? In other words, is there a good class of things which are you know weakly orthogonal to 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 the to the uh, lens uh, functors? Is that known? So you, you you'd have a a a, a, a lens functor. And you'd be looking at things which have a weak lifting property with respect to that. So it's a, the kind of thing that people who do, do uh, you know, uh, model categories uh, um, uh, just continually are looking at. Has anybody thought about that? Um, I don't think such a rule. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I suggest we stop this discussion and move to a question from Miloslav. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, could you maybe say uh, a little bit about the last point of the general theory of categories of morphisms with extra structure? Like, what's your idea about this? For sure. Uh, great, great question. So I mentioned on the, the second last slide this notion of imported kernel pair, um, which is a particular instance of this notion of imported uh, pullback, which were these sort of things where you, you take a pullback of the, the, the get functors and then there's a canonical way to put a, a lens structure on them to get a, a commuting square in, in lens, except it doesn't satisfy uh, the, the universal property of a pullback. Now, I guess, I mean, so lens is kind of interesting as a category in that it's, it's got this, the, the same objects as cat, but the morphisms have this, this, this extra structure. Um, and I guess 
the, the question is what's the right way to, 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 to view these, these imported pullbacks? So, I mean, so one, one thing, so, so Zoltan tomorrow is actually gonna give a talk about um, the, this tree width and spine categories. And in that talk, he introduces a notion he calls a proxy push out. And if you sort of dualize that notion, you get a, a definition of what a proxy pullback might be. And now our uh, imported pullbacks would uh, satisfy that definition. But I suspect, I mean, if you want to develop a, a, a general theory of this, this kind of notion of these kind of limits, which don't really satisfy universal properties, but still are nice, like you might want like maybe you start with something like that and you add some extra axioms and you see what you can derive from that or I'm, I'm not entirely sure where, where, where this would go but I think that might give a flavor of what, what I kind of meant meant by that point yeah okay, okay. thank you thank you um, I think we should move on to be fair on time but not before we give Matt a round of applause thank you Matt Right. The next talk is by Fabrizio Genovese, if all is correct. It is and correct. There we go. Everything is working. And it's going to be about a categorical semantics for bounded Petri nets. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, Chris, when I have five minutes left, including questions, uh, can you just yell very loudly at me so that I remember that? I'll try and go against my better nature, yes. <laughs> okay. Cool. Thanks. Okay, so this is a joint work with Fosco, Fosco Rejan, and Daniele Palundi. Uh, and this is not the first, not the second, not the third, but the fourth installment uh, in a series of papers that studies uh, extensions of Petronets um, categorically. Uh, our real end goal is to have as many papers about this as there are Fast and Furious movies. And I think we are getting pretty close to, to that goal. So this said, uh, what is a patronet? Uh, does someone know? Everyone is muted, so I can infer that you're all shouting, yes, we know, but I will tell you anyway. Uh, a patronet is basically a model for concurrency uh, that is made of places, transitions, and tokens. In these pictures, the places are the blue circles, the transitions are the gray squares, and the tokens are the dots. Uh, basically, places represent, uh, represent bags that hold resources of some type, and um, these resources are um, represented as tokens inhabiting the places, and the transitions are ways of you know, transforming resources into other resources. So we can basically run these patronets by firing transitions, as you can see, and the result is that the tokens move around. This model that is uh, very simple has been proven incredibly fruitful in uh, research in computer science, chemistry, and concurrent systems of any sort. Um, now, one thing that you can do in a patronet, this is a very classical thing to do, is bounding a patronet. Uh, what does it mean to bound a patronet? Um, it means that if you look at this picture on the left, basically uh, this transition here is, uh, has no uh, inputs. Uh, so this transition can fire at libitum because it doesn't have to consume any token. It just produces tokens. Uh, this means that in particular, this place on the right uh, can eventually have an arbitrary number of tokens inside of it. Uh, sometimes we don't want this behavior. And so a very standard way to fix this problem is to um, introduce uh, a copy for each place of the net, but with the arrows pointing in uh, the opposite direction. Um, so you see, for instance, this place has an inward arrow from the top and an outward uh, arrow to the bottom. We introduce another one on the right with the arrows flipped. And now you see that every transition in this uh, right picture will also have some input places. And so basically now this net is bounded, meaning that as soon as I assign tokens to the red places, 
I am automatically bounding uh, the blue places, saying, okay, if there are like five tokens in the leftmost place, uh, this will somehow bound the number of tokens in the rightmost place, in this case, exactly. So we wanted to describe this uh, categorically. Why categorically? Well, because there is a very, very long established correspondence between uh, patronets and um, symmetric monoidal categories or commutative monoidal categories. So uh, what does it mean? Intuitively, before I go into details of this, just look at this picture. The idea is that on the top, I have a patronet and on the bottom, I have a string diagram. The idea is that I can use the places of the patronet to generate the monoid of objects uh, of a symmetric monoidal category and the transition of the net to generate um, morphisms in um, a symmetric monoidal category. And now you see every execution of this patronet becomes a string diagram uh, in the bottom picture. So you can do this with various types of categories. Uh, the most used one is symmetric monoidal categories, but another very nice choice is commutative monoidal categories that are symmetric monoidal categories where the symmetry is the identity. Um, what is the difference? The difference is that in a commutative monoidal category, you cannot really tell tokens apart, like you can swap uh, any two tokens in the string diagram without noticing it, while in the symmetric case, you always have to introduce symmetries explicitly. So you very granularly distinguish between different tokens. Um, the result of this is that basically symmetric model categories embed what is called the individual token philosophy for patronets. Uh, that is useful in mainly computer science and commutative monoidal categories uh, represent the collective token philosophy that is useful in chemistry. So in detail, as I say, you take a net N and you use the places of N to generate objects and transitions of N to generate morphisms of this corresponding category that I denote uh, C of N. Uh, objects and morphisms then are interpreted as follows. Objects of CN correspond to markings. So A tensor A tensor B means two tokens in A, one token in B, and morphisms correspond to sequences of transition firings, exactly as in this picture. Okay, so now that we have this idea, we want to say, what is a bounded net? So you give me a net N, I can generate these uh, commutative, free commutative uh, monoidal category, um, C of N, and then I say that the internal bound semantics of N in the collective token philosophy is given by the free commutative strict model category generated as follows. For each generating object A, we introduce two object generators, A plus and A minus, and for each generating morphism of this form, we introduce a generating morphism where basically for each B, we plug a B minus here, and for each A, we plug an A minus here. Uh, in the end, since this category is freely generated, uh, it corresponds itself to another patronet M, uh, and so you have that this CBN, this free category that we just uh, instantiated, it's actually presented by this patronet M that is exactly the bounded net in the picture that I showed you uh, in the beginning. Um, so we have that, you know, categorically we can describe pretty easily what's going on. And moreover, this assignment from CN to CBN is a co-monad in the category of free commutative uh, strict model categories and functors between them. Uh, and you can prove this quite easily, just manually by checking the co-monad conditions. But now we want to do something uh, a bit better. And to do that, we really leverage on uh, this idea that we started applying uh, a couple of years ago of describing extensions of patronets as functors from their corresponding free monoidal categories to some other category. Um, basically, with this kind of trick, you can describe things like uh, guarded nets where, um, or also called colored nets that are a very common extension of patronets. And uh, in this particular case, what we wanna do is we want to define 
a functor that goes from this CN to some other category uh, so that to each token, we basically attach some information that tells us something about the bound going on in the net. Um, the funny, the, the good thing is that since this uh, commutative, this CN, this commut free commutative um, monoidal category is freely generated, to define these functors, it is enough to say where the generating objects and morphisms of CN are mapped to, which means that I just have to define this thing by saying where each place and transition of N goes. Um, so with this idea in mind, we define a pattern with an S semantics where S is uh, any uh, symmetric monoidal category as a pair N and sharp where N is a net and N sharp is a lux monoidal lux functor from CN to S. What does it mean lux monoidal lux? It means that it's lux both in composition and uh, on the monoidal product. So basically it's super weak. Okay, and then we say that a morphism of uh, such nets is just a functor that, you know, uh, between, uh, this would be C, by the way, between the corresponding um, C, uh, free categories that makes the obvious square commute. So it's basically a morphism from CN to CM, uh, such that these uh, sharp functors are uh, preserved in the commutative triangle. And with this idea, you can form a, a monoidal category called Pedri F uh, of nets with S semantics and uh, morphisms between them. Okay, now we want to use this to redefine this idea of boundedness as externally, so as a functor. Um, so uh, the first thing to notice is that in a free commutative strict monoidal category, there are no equations between generators. What does it mean? Going back to this slide, it means that if I have a string diagram with these boxes, I cannot rewrite or replace these boxes in any way because I have no equations that allow me to do that. So I can for sure modify string diagrams, uh, you know, using the string diagrams identities and stuff like that. But the number of boxes of generating morphisms that I use stays the same. So why uh, this is useful? Uh, this is useful because then I can define a, fu a function that I call chi that takes any string diagram in my uh, free commutative monoidal category and it maps it to a multiset on the generating objects, on the generating morphism, sorry, that is basically counting how many times I use a generating morphism in that string diagram. And with this idea in mind, now I can define a, a lux monoidal lux functor that goes from CN to span. And what I do is each object of A is mapped to the set of uh, objects of CN and each morphism is sent to this span um, where S and T denote source and target of a morphism in CN. So what is that I am doing here? I am basically saying that each token is being mapped to the set of objects of CN. These, uh, you can, um, the, sorry, the free monoid on the set of objects of CN. This means that basically each token gets mapped to a set of all the possible token distributions of the nets. These token distributions will represent the distributions on the anti places of the bounded nets. And each morphism that is basically a bunch of transitions that move the tokens uh, is mapped to the corresponding um, multiset that is basically saying how the tokens in the anti places have to move. And this is why target and source are swapped, because you see anti places had inbound and outbound arrows reversed. So the idea is that every time you apply F, this gets mapped to something that tells you how you have to transfer anti tokens from uh, some anti place to the other. Um, so these things uh, form a subcategory of Petri span that we call Petri span B that stands for bounded. As you see, we are very creative with uh, giving names. So what is the idea and why do we need the uh, laxity, the lax monoidal lax 
functor to make this thing work. This, I think, is the nicest uh, uh, thing that we do in our paper uh, conceptually. And the idea is that you could imagine that basically each token in your original net comes endowed with a property that is an element of that set S plus. So for instance, P1 knows that um, there is a one token in the anti-place corresponding to P1 and uh, four tokens in the anti-place uh, corresponding to P3 in this diagram. So this is some local knowledge. And P2 knows also, you know, a distribution of tokens in the anti-places of this net. So these are the local informations that they have. But these are informations that pertain the global status of the net. So to be useful, useful, they have to be merged. And that's what the laxator does. The laxator is saying that in this kind of semantics, we are extending the net by attaching information to tokens of the net but this information is not local, it's global. And so now I can't talk anymore about like local semantics for these tokens, but this, this becomes a sort of like token cloud where this knowledge is merged and indeed this is what happens here on the left. And now these tokens can move around using this information on the corresponding bounds. So what is the relation between internal and external uh, bound semantics? Uh, um, in, in, you know, what are, we, we gave two different ways of constructing this bound semantics. So what is the relation? The relation uh, comes from these categorical equivalents that basically says that, you know, the category of categories over CN uh, and the category of lux functors from CN to span are equivalent. And uh, these are mediated on the left by this functor gamma that I don't think I'll present in detail, and on the right by the gradient deconstruction. So uh, basically, you can prove that this category CBN, the one that presented at the beginning, the internal semantics for the bounded patronet, is isomorphic to the gradient deconstruction on the functor N sharp that we defined here. And uh, Fabrizio, this is five minutes. Perfect, thank you. So how does this work? Well, it's standard written deconstruction. Uh, the objects of um, integral and sharp are couples where X is an object of C and X, small X, is in N sharp of X. So what is small X? Small X is exactly a piece of information like this one. So in here, elements are a distribution of tokens in the main net plus a distribution of tokens in the anti-places. And what are morphisms? Morphisms are exactly morphisms of our category, so executions from X to Y, such that the corresponding span can map small X to small Y. So this means that you have to move the tokens around, but also the tokens in the anti-place have to move accordingly in the opposite direction. Um, and this is basically the very core of the work we are doing for any one of these extensions of patronus, we are giving two possible semantics, an internal one and an external one. And then we prove that they are related via the grid in deconstruction. This is true for a lot of flavors of patronus we present so far. So why is this useful? Well, uh, the two semantics have uh, pros and cons. The internal version throws everything in the same bucket. Uh, but the good thing about uh, throwing everything in the same bucket is that you can do efficient model checking because in the end what you got is, is a standard patronet and we have a lot of tools to verify that this patronet works. Uh, in uh, the functor approach, everything is uh, instead neatly separated uh, and we explored this idea of giving a sort of non-local semantics to the net to achieve this. And as I say, the Excel semantics is type correctly satisfying. The internal one is better for model checking purposes and the grid and deconstructions put the two together. Uh, and what we did in the paper then is generalizing everything also to the individual token philosophy. So symmetric monodal categories and not any more commutative. Everything becomes hyper more difficult instantly. And basically you have to prove everything abstractly. So these uh, equivalence is really important. Like for instance, you cannot play this trick uh, anymore because now you have symmetries around and defining this span manually is just like a nightmare. 
But instead, we have these high level tools that I, the category theory gives us. So we could do the commutative case and generalize without really getting our hands dirty. And I think that that's what's really powerful uh, in category theory that we can apply on the study of happiness. So future work, um, what is that we want to do? Well, as I said, studying functors with, from C to D where C is free has proved to be hyper useful to study extensions of computational structures like automata and nets. That's what we discovered in the last year or so, year and a half. Uh, and up to now we described garden nets, hierarchical nets, bounded nets, this one, mana nets that are another kind of nets that we come up with because it was cool. And uh, now we are going to look at time nets, nets with inhibitor arc and dependent automata and nets. So we uh, are already working on some of these things. And in general, I, we think that there is still a lot of gas in the tank uh, for this approach. And we are very eager to tell you more as soon as uh, we are you know, active enough uh, to look into it. Um, now it's summer, so I just want to drink and sleep, but as soon as September comes, I promise you, I will get to it uh, again. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's basically it. So questions. Excellent timing. Thank you, Fabrizio. We have time for one or two questions, if we have any. Are there any? Yeah, Jules has got one. I'm going to move to him now. Hi. So, hello. In your, hi. Uh, in your internal semantics, you're kind of basically adding negative objects. Um, like your, your anti places are like negative objects. And we have a whole zoo of ways already to add negative objects to a category like, uh, like in construction, CPM, uh, lenders, dialectical category, shoe spaces. Do you know is this related to any of these? I didn't really look into it, uh, mainly because the categories we are manipulate are free monoidal categories. So basically you have close to zero structure. Uh, for what I remember, the CPN construction is done on closed monoidal categories, for instance. So I, I don't even know. Probably if we do bounded nets for nets with integer tokens that present free monoidal categories, uh, free commute compact closed categories, sorry, it could be that what you say is exactly true and that this gives us something like the CPN construction. I would be very curious to look into it. I didn't think about that, so uh, thank you. That's something I will look into for sure. But yeah, in general, our categories are very weak. And by the way, that's exactly their power because since they are free and barely satisfy anything, I can map them into any other category. So that gives me the power to define all the extensions like using functors and stuff like, stuff like that. Um, I have a follow-up to that because if I understand correctly, your bounding construction is a co-monad, right? Uh, we know that yeah. things like the CPM and CHU, I think, are not, so they can't be the same. But an obvious question then is, what, what is the co Kleisley category? Does that mean anything in terms of Petri nets? Uh, good question. Uh, again, I didn't look into it precisely, uh, but if I remember correctly, in the last months there have been some uh, discussions about uh, Kleisley categories for categories of nets on uh, the category theory Zulip server. And the point is that basically uh, when you define a morphism of patronets, I don't know if you can see this, but when you can when you define a morphism of patronets, uh, you define it by saying, I have these transitions, input and outputs, these are multisets. And then I say, cool, a morphism is just something that makes this square commute. The one, the bottom row is another net. And this is a function. And now to define things here, I can do two things. I can either give a function between the sets P and P prime and lift it to the corresponding functions between multisets, or I can directly give a multiset homomorphism. This is what we have been doing, and also John Bai's group and other groups have been doing for a long time now. While this, that is way more expressive, is what uh, people uh, did in the 90s, in the beginning of, of this kind of field. 
And the idea is that if you use this one, then you can map uh, a single generator of these nets to a single transition to a sequence of transitions here. So it's way more powerful. But there was some discussion about the idea of capturing this age by starting with the G and then you know, describing these things using uh, monads or comonads. So I think that probably if you look at, uh, you know, uh, Kleisley categories or these things and stuff like that, uh, it may be that you go in that direction. Again, I have zero elements to say that this is true, but eventually time permitting, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. And yeah. Okay, thank you. As we're now eating into the tea break, I suppose we stop the discussion there, but please unmute yourself and join me in thanking Fabrizio and all the speakers of this session and all their co-authors and you know everyone thank you very much <laughs> <laughs>